Hi there, and welcome to the Alberta Update, a look at what's happening in your province. I am your host, Bruce McAllister. Thank you for being with us today. Well, coming up, we're going to chat with the Premier about a few things. Uh, Her recent trip to Ottawa, to Toronto, and Washington. We will get her take on Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibault's latest announcement about not building any more roads in Canada. Energy and Minerals Minister uh, Brian Jean will be here to chat about a proposed bill from the federal NDP with an intent to stop Albertans from sharing positive news about the oil and gas industry. Another head scratcher. Plus, uh, Health Minister Adriana Lagrange joins us to talk about health care in the province and the steps our province is taking to uh, to address positive changes in the system. All that and much more coming up on the Alberta Update. Uh, first, Premier Danielle Smith making a trip uh, down to Washington, D.C. in an effort to reinforce Alberta's role as a key partner in the global energy transition. This after the province opened a new office in Ottawa with helps of amplifying Alberta's message uh, on the national stage. Premier Smith joining us now uh, with more on what these efforts will do for the province and uh, why these steps are critical. Uh, good day, Premier. Hi, Bruce. Hey, so much to ask you about. Um, obviously, I'm going to ask you about the, the latest announcement from Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibault. Before we get to that, though, let's uh, let's talk about your trip last week to Ontario and to Washington. What were some of the most significant developments in your view? Well, uh, I'll deal with them because I went to three different places. I went to Ottawa, then Toronto, then Washington. In Ottawa, we were opening up our new office. And I I suppose some people might be shaking their heads saying, has it really come to this, that Alberta needs to have a diplomatic office in Ottawa? And I would have to say, yes, it really has come to this. Quebec has one. And we need a a place since the federal government continues to interfere and intervene in our jurisdiction. We can't continue to be sitting back, waiting for them to hit us with something and then turn around and fight them in the courts. So we're going to be fighting them politically. So um, James Carpenter is going to be leading up our efforts there. And it will be an office for all of our ministers to be able to go to and have those uh, those important meetings. Uh, Then we also I also spoke to the Economic Club of Canada, as well as uh, speaking to the Canada Strong and Free Network. And the main thing is just that uh, this country can work. We've got just the the, the, the absolute uh, best when it comes to resources, the best talent. I think that uh, Albertans are proud Canadians, but we want to be treated with respect and we want to be able to contribute to, to uh, Confederation. And that means continuing to be the wealth creators that we are. So that's one of the messages I had there. In Toronto, I met with a number of people from the financial services industry expressing, uh, number one, we're open for business, continue to keep the investment dollars coming here. Our 8% corporate income tax rate should be very attractive in that regard. But also just mindfully letting them know that I'm watching what's happening as we're trying to build new natural gas power plants, even with a abatement for CO2, and the banks are not coming forward with capital. So I wanted them to know that our model in Alberta for reliability requires us to be able to bring that baseload power on. So I just wanted to put them on notice that we'll be uh, pushing that along uh, a little bit further. And then Washington. Washington, it was, a, again, in America. We love you. We are a great trading partner. We are a great friend. Alberta has $161 billion worth of, of goods going back and forth between us and America. And uh, you're hearing America talk about creating protect- protectionist policies, maybe looking to Iran or, or Venezuela for future energy supply. And my message was, we're right here. We're, we're a friend, we're an ally, and we should really be thinking about a North American energy security strategy. So those are the, the main messages, and I think it was a successful trip. Hey, speaking of that, listen, let's um, let's let's go to a quick clip. You did a lot of media when you were down there in Washington. You did in Ontario as well. Uh, but here is here is one from an interview uh, that you did in Washington talking about Alberta welcoming global energy demand. The value proposition on these heavy forms of crude is, is very high because they can be used for a variety of things, not only combustion and diesel, but also for asphalt. And whether we're, we're driving uh, gasoline-powered vehicles or zero-emissions vehicles, we're all going to need roads to, to drive them on. We also know that uh, a barrel of oil already has 6,000 different products that you can make out of it. And so being able to, to find those additional markets so that they can be refined locally to whatever that, that unique mix is, 
is for each nation. We, we are absolutely open to having those conversations. And I, I think that that's going to be a, a new a new era for my province as, as well as for Canada, that we can finally talk about the ways in which we can meet that that global demand. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having that conversation on the interest uh, on the on the issue of, of LNG. Um, I know that the J- Japan is very keen on either having LNG export, but I think principally they're interested in ammonia. And one of the things about Alberta is that we have one of the best geologies in the entire world for carbon capture, utilization and storage. My, my officials tell me that we have the ability to sequester um, the equivalent of all of the emissions that have already been produced by man so far to give you some idea of just how, how great our geology is. So if we're able to capture the CO2 and then in turn export ammonia to be able to meet that market, I, I think that that opens up a, an entirely new conversation with our, with our friends in Asia. Clearly, Premier, you uh, you were trying to get that message out, and I think you were successful about Al- Alberta, uh, you know, being a, a key player, a key partner in the energy industry, wanting to work with Washington. Um, listen, then you hear about Ottawa talking about emissions caps on our oil and gas industry. Minister Jean uh, is going to be here to talk to us about some of that today, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that and trying to work through that push in Ottawa. Well, I'm so frustrated that those who should be our greatest allies and partners in getting our products to market are constantly talking down and talking negative about uh, the future prospects for LNG export, um, as well as for the continued development of, of our energy sector. We, we are simply not going to acquiesce to a production cap. That's what they're trying to do. When they, when they talk about an emissions cap, they mean a production cap. And, and we know that because when I put it out there that, in fact, I think the world needs more Canadian energy and we should be having an asset aspiration to double our oil and natural gas production. Well, that prompted a reaction from the federal government uh, where they they seem to express surprise that you could do both, increase your production and reduce emissions. But we can. We know we can because of carbon capture utilization and storage. We can because uh, natural gas is going to be the base of new economy fuels like hydrogen and ammonia and methanol. We know because we're seeing the development of bitumen beyond combustion, where our bitumen is going to be increasingly used for construction materials, whether it's asphalt for roads or, or potentially uh, graphite, so it could be used in batteries, even potential um, uh, carbon nanofiber to be used for steel. So this is why I'm very bullish. I absolutely believe that we can reduce emissions, but we're going to keep on growing this industry. Well, uh, Premier, yesterday, the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen Gubo, uh, made quite an announcement. He announced uh, that the feds won't be building any more roads in Canada. Now, he has since walked walked those comments back, saying that he was misinterpreted. In any event, it was pretty clear what he said. And to not build any more roads in a country like Canada where we're growing, I think of Alberta, is just plain bizarre. Your reaction to what he said? Well, it's like he's never stepped foot outside of Montreal. I mean, I can understand if all you have ever done in your life has lived in an urban environment where you can take the bus. I can understand that you might not know how big this country is. You might not know where resources get developed. You might not know that when you have a a country as vast as Canada, not only east to west, but north to south, you need roads to drive on. So the, the, the problem with Guibault is that he's getting increasingly erratic and bizarre. The more and more, the more every time he opens his mouth is to come up with some, with some new unattainable policy pronouncement. And the only thing that I scratch my head over is why his caucus and why his cabinet uh, have not done something about him. He's destroying the credibility of the Liberals. He's destroying national unity. He's acting in a lawless way because he's not, it's not abiding by the Constitution or by the, the, the decisions of the courts. It's just mystifying that he continues to, to be out there making these ridiculous pr- pronouncements. I, I suppose the good news this time is it wasn't just me who had to say how, how, how uh, what, what lunacy this was. You had Doug Ford who also weighed in, as well as Brian uh, or David Eby in British Columbia weighing mm-hmm. in. So if you've got premiers from all across the the, pro, uh, the country with different political stripes all saying the same thing, you know, there's one person who's, who's wrong and it's the environment minister. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this case, even 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 the media, some of his closest allies in the media were turning on him on this one. So uh, I take your point entirely. Listen, one more and I'll let you go. I know session is coming up. You'll be back in the legislature for budget on, uh, on the 29th of the month. You can't obviously preempt budget and give us any details about what's coming. Uh, but what can Albertans expect in the next legislative session? 
Well, the, the first, I, I can tell you the first budget that we came through with put forward a proposal for how we would limit your over your spending growth so that we could develop a surplus management strategy, pay down debt, put money into our Heritage Savings Trust Fund, as well as do one-time spending. And I, I'm going to continue to put that message forward so that people understand that there is a, a pathway for us getting off this revenue roller coaster, but it is going to require us as a province and as a people to decide that, that we're going to, to steward those resources better. So that will be one of the, the things that, we, that we, we end up talking about. Uh, no surprise, we'll continue to be addressing issues of affordability, particularly around electricity. The pause will be coming off February 29th, so we will have more to say about the new market design to make sure that we have some certainty for people about what their electricity prices are going to be. Uh, healthcare reform continues to be um, our, our number one issue. It's our biggest ticket item, and we're right in the middle of some pretty dramatic reforms to make sure everybody gets a family doctor, is able to get their loved one into the kind of appropriate care that they need, for whether it's continuing care or mental health and addiction, and getting our hospitals operating efficiently and, and clearing through that backlog of surgery. So you will see a lot more work being done on that as well. Well, and so there's uh, there's more to come. I think we uh, we have about uh, about 12 bills that that will be uh, implementing, and so it's going to be a pretty busy session. Well, you'd be pleased to know uh, Health Minister Adrienne Lagrange is standing by. We're going to talk to her momentarily about all the work she's doing in the ministry. Premier, as always, we appreciate your time. Thanks for stopping by. You bet. Thank you. In a move that has shocked many across the country, federal NDP Member of Parliament Charlie Angus has introduced a private member's bill that would prescribe jail time for those who speak in favor of fossil fuels. Bill C-372, also known as the Fossil Fuel Advertising Act, was tabled uh, last week. As it's written, the bill would not only criminalize the advertising of Canadian oil and gas and jail company leaders who promote it, uh, but it suggests Canadians be convicted and fined up to half a million dollars for something as simple as wearing a shirt with an oil and gas company logo on it or a bumper sticker supporting Alberta oil and gas. It just sounds so bizarre. Minister of Energy and Minerals, Brian Jean, joins us now to talk more about this move by the federal NDP and get some reaction to it. Good day, Minister. Great to see you. Can you believe this crazy law? How can people actually take this individual seriously, recognizing the importance of the oil and gas sector, not just to our economy, but just to people's quality of life? It's an absolutely crazy law that steps away from reality, but also lacks the opportunity and judgment to see what great things, great value oil and gas brings to, for instance, First Nations communities, um, building schools and hospitals and roads, infrastructure, bringing that incredibly high quality of life to the people of Canada. It wouldn't happen without the oil and gas sector. Uh, Minister Well said, listen, I, I'm just going to ask you point blank, what, what is going on here? I mean, surely this will be defeated, won't it? I think uh, I served with Charlie for a while. I think he's looking for attention of the NDP, let's face it. Uh, they have lost all relevance of reality for most Canadians. And so right now they're trying to uh, pick away at anything they can to try to get the attention and uh, create a movement. Because let's face it, whether it's the NDP here in Alberta or the NDP federally, we just get a whole bunch of crazy notions that are just have no form of reality. The basis between reality and what they're proposing is just, it, it's a 747 in between. It's just huge. Listen, second, secondly, I'd like to ask you about this. We had the Liberal Minister, uh, the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change uh, tell us that we don't need any more roads or that the federal government isn't going to provide any more funding for roads, that we have enough roads already in Canada. Imagine a country like Canada. Now, he has since walked back those comments, but I've got to ask you, as the Minister of, uh, of Energy and Minerals from a northern, uh, on, uh, northern Alberta riding, I mean, what's, what's your take on, on this uh, from Stephen Guibault? Well, the, the stark uh, reality between the NDP and the Liberal government federally is becoming narrower. They are becoming just as crazy as each other. Uh, no more roads. I mean, what he's saying is, I live downtown Montreal, nobody else gets the same quality of life that I get. I'm Stephen Guibault, and I can fly all over the world at the taxpayer's expense, emitting more GHGs than anybody else probably per capita on the planet. And yet I'm going to preach to you about the quality of life you can live. You can't have my quality of life. That's what he's saying to the the 10 million or so people every year that die from energy uh, poverty. Like he is just not 
any basis of reality. And we need to recognize that as Canadians in the next general election. We need to elect a party, and I believe the Conservative Party of Canada is the right party, to elect them into a place of leadership that can take our country back to the place it should be and the people to the great quality of life we deserve. Minister, uh, look, you're, you're a very optimistic guy. I know this, and um, I'd like you to, to, to talk about some of the optimism from the oil and gas industry, uh, the broader energy industry. Uh, tell us why uh, you've been so upbeat about, uh, about the future of that industry lately. Well, the more you learn about what Alberta has as far as assets that belong to the people, the more excited you become, whether it's the oil and gas sector, which is obviously a dominant player, or in fact, the titanium, vanadium, um, the helium, there are so many different opportunities, lithium, world-class deposit, and we have the people and the expertise to be able to take these great assets and turn them into some value for the world. And if they want to move away from oil and gas, well, they can do that for the combustion engine because we have the, all the alternatives for them to move away. We've got the precious metals. We've got so many different things here in Alberta. All we need to do is get the federal government to get their crazy ideas out of the way and quit having the NDP, the federal NDP, wagging the, the, being the tail that wags the dog. Um, really what we need is a reasonable, responsible government that works in the best interest of the people. And neither the Liberal uh, or the NDP National Caucus can deliver that. Only the Conservatives can. And, you know, I, I am a fan of the Conservatives and the Conservative policy because I did sit in that caucus for 10 years. And, and they are people that are very reasonable, very balanced, and will frankly get the job done for Canadians in a reasonable, balanced way. Minister of Energy and Minerals, Brian Jean, always good to talk to you. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Bruce. It's great to be here. Well, Alberta's government is strengthening privacy protections for Albertans. The world we live in today is uh, is powered in many ways by data. It drives everything from advertising to real estate. Government relies on data, of course, uh, to help make operational decisions, inform policy, to provide services as well. And new frameworks are going to ensure that data is used ethically throughout the government and protects Albertans' personal information. These frameworks are a signal that Alberta's government is doubling down on our commitment to Albertans' right to privacy. These frameworks complement and build on our existing privacy legislation, and they are designed to give Albertans more confidence and trust in how their government manages and uses data, a critical element to the Alberta government's work to modernize how we deliver services. Minister of Technology and Innovation Nate Glubish uh, will launch a series of initiatives to further strengthen Alberta's privacy rights. This will include a proposal to ensure the penalties for misusing the data of Albertans or violating their privacy are the strongest in Canada. Well, the Premier just talked about it. Alberta's government is pulling out all the stops to stabilize, to strengthen, and to improve Alberta's primary health care system. Family doctors will soon receive additional payments to help them manage an increasing number of patients. Uh, joining me to chat more about this and some of the other developments in the, uh, the health care uh, file in the province is Health Minister Adriana Lagrange. Minister, always appreciate you taking some time to join us. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Bruce. Happy to be here. You you have uh, you have now been to several engagement sessions. Uh, you've been gathering feedback from Albertans. Uh, you mm -hmm. have been to several hospital and healthcare centers mm -hmm. on tours. Uh, yeah. What have you heard so far? Are there any common themes emerging? Uh, well, yes, there are. And, and I, I just want to share that uh, we started with 44 engagement sessions right across the whole province. And we've expanded that by an additional, I believe, 11 or 12. And we'll add more if we need them because so many people want to have a say on the refocusing. And, and so what I'm hearing is that they're finally feeling like they're being heard and they haven't felt that in the past. Uh, they really are appreciating the uh, sessions that we're offering, the ability to engage. Um, when I ask the question, who thinks the current health system is working here in Alberta? There is silence because the vast majority of people really know they have a personal story. Um, the healthcare workers have, um, you know, lived experience to show that it isn't working and we need to do something differently. So that is the preemptive theme that I'm hearing across the province. We need to do something differently. What, what about those healthcare professionals themselves, Minister? Uh, what do they want to see as part of the restructuring? Or, or maybe I'll put it like this. How do we improve patient care uh, 
with our frontline workers at the forefront? Well, they really would like to see more decision making made at the local level. They feel they have solutions, that they have the ability to offer um, improvements, but they're not being heard. The structure, the current structure, really doesn't allow for that. Um, There's a heavy bureaucracy that we have to weed through. There's a lot of red tape. And, um, and, you know, so they feel sometimes their hands are tied. They really do want to provide excellent health care. And sometimes the structures that are in place, um, the, the resource allocations aren't where they should be. And so they feel that they can't actually provide the quality of care that they want to provide. So uh, they have a lot of great ideas on how we can improve the system. I'm hearing many of them as I go across the province. And... Uh, the other part that I would really, you know, um, want to stress to the general public that's out there is we have excellent uh, health care workers across this province. Like they really care. They really want to do their best. And we need to empower them to be able to do that. Oh, boy. So well said. And uh, so many of us know so many health care mm-hmm. workers. It's an important point, Minister. And if you're, if you're going to go about change, uh, you're so wise to go to those people to get some feedback on what that change look like, looks like. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you about the Alberta Medical Association. Mm-hmm. They have been vocal lately about physician compensation and the viability of their practices. Do you share their concerns and what are you doing to address them? Well, I absolutely share their concerns. Uh, anytime we have uh, family physicians that are struggling, we we want to be, um, you know, make sure that uh, we help them because, of course, they are one of the foundational bedrocks of primary care and healthcare in Alberta. So we want to make sure we're doing what we can. Um, you know, both um, the Alberta Medical Association, myself, uh, we have a new president in the Alberta Medical Association. We both are struggling with the fact that, you know, 15 months ago, there was an agreement signed, a, a, a nego- negotiated agreement with the Alberta Medical Association and Government of Alberta uh, on financial compensation. And it's worth about 789 million dollars over four years and unfortunately at that time the uh, AMA did not prioritize their family medicine physicians and and that didn't come to the forefront so um, so we're working within the agreement but also uh, since that agreement because we do recognize the need to help physicians with the inflationary costs etc that are happening in in the province uh, I've been able to secure an additional $257 $257 million to help stabilize family medicine over the next couple of years. And as we work together, and, and I'll uh, congratulate the Alberta Medical Association for really coming to the table and wanting to find a new funding model that actually will work for family physicians and, and general medicine practitioners within the province. And so we are having those discussions on an ongoing basis. I believe we're meeting twice a week right now to try and get that um, model, um, you know, actualized. And, uh, but in the meantime, we know that there are financial difficulties. And so we've provided that additional $257 million. Minister, one more and I'll let you go. Uh, sure. Look, you and the Premier have been very bold and uh, and and uh, forthright in your commitment to improving health care for mm-hmm. Albertans. So is it too early to ask you, have there been any notable changes to this point? Is there anything you can share with us in terms of developments uh, so far? Well, I I can um, absolutely share that we've had some successes. Um, While we know there's more to go, um, we are seeing that uh, surgery wait times are down, uh, particularly for hip and knee surgeries. And so I'm I'm happy to share that that's moving in the right direction. EMS response times are down as well. So again, you know, someone phones for an ambulance, it's coming in a more timely fashion. So we're really proud of about that. Um, We also are seeing that we're able to attract more doctors and nurses. And I believe the last time we spoke, I had mentioned about, you know, the 3,500 nurses that are registered to practice um, in the province. That's a very positive step. I can share that uh, through the College of Physicians and Surgeons, we now have over 330 doctors that have registered to practice in Alberta, of which about 170 are family physicians. And so, That's a positive story as well, but we do know we have much, much more work to do, and we are committed to doing that great work. Listen, I know nobody, uh, not too many people start their days as early as you do. You've got a lot on your your plate. We appreciate you taking some time to update us on what's very important to Albertans. Thank you, Minister.
My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Health Minister Adrienne Lagrange joining us. Uh, well, in other news, the Alberta government has invested $1.2 million in a project that is now providing affordable housing to 24 families in Calgary. Uh, the Mustard Seeds Hub 29 project provides seven two-bedroom and 17 three-bedroom units. This facility also includes a community hub space, a preschool, a daycare, and a community cafe and kitchen. These affordable homes will ensure that vulnerable families are able to grow and thrive in a caring and supportive environment. The Alberta government has been investing heavily in supporting uh, vulnerable Albertans in 2023. In 2023, that included a commitment to develop nearly 2,000 affordable housing spaces. The Premier and Minister of Tourism and Sport, Joseph Scow, announcing a new long-term tourism strategy that will see the sector uh, reach $25 billion by 2035. In 2022, Alberta saw a record $10.7 billion in tourism spending. That's an increase of uh, $600 million from 2019 levels. The new strategy will share Alberta's story and history around the world. Uh, this will help grow and diversify the economy, create jobs, and help Indigenous communities to develop and expand tourism opportunities. In every corner of Alberta and in all four seasons, visitors can discover welcoming communities and unforgettable experiences and Alberta's visibility is higher than ever thanks to the film and television tax credit which has drawn major productions like The Last of Us and Prey which is uh, putting our province on screens worldwide with such incredible landscapes and an equally impressive range of cultural attractions right in our backyard Alberta already has the assets that we need to sustain a strong tourism industry for decades to come signaling to the industry that when it comes to Alberta's visitor economy, our best days are ahead of us, and our government is here to support that growth. Growth that will propel our province to new heights with an industry-focused, market-driven approach to development in our tourism sector. I'd like to thank the government of Alberta, Travel Alberta, and everyone who's contributed to this strategy. We believe it marks a pivotal moment in time for the entire Indigenous visitor economy here in Alberta, and I am very grateful and looking forward to what the future holds for the Indigenous tourism and overall visitor economy throughout the province. In 2022, Alberta saw 32 million visits, generating $10.7 billion in spending and supporting more than 80,000 full-time equivalent jobs. A new Heritage Minute is uh, helping to highlight the accomplishments of the first Chinese-Canadian to play in the Canadian Football League. Alberta's Norman Kwong is a CFL Hall of Famer. Of course, he's a, uh, he's a uh, former, or he was Alberta's 16th Lieutenant Governor. Uh, let's take a look at that Heritage Minute. Sports is life. It's clear cut. Things out in the open. There's nowhere to hide. I had to prove myself more than anyone else. You must be so proud of your son. He's gonna go pro. The sky's the limit. My nan go on on. There's always a winner and a loser. You cannot reach the sky in broken cleats. Of course, I always want to be the winner. And I did reach the sky. Norman Kwa, the first Chinese-Canadian professional football player, still holds records to this day. He retired from the sport in 1960 and later became Lieutenant Governor of Alberta. Alberta's government helped create, uh, help work with local talent, I should say, to create this Made in Alberta Heritage Minute through the uh, Alberta Made Production Grant and the Training and Membership Incentive. Well, that does it for the Alberta Update this week as we bring you a first-hand look at what is happening with your government and uh, what is going on in Alberta, the stories that matter to you. You can always view the Alberta Update uh, on YouTube. Go to the Your Alberta YouTube page or the premieres at A.B. Danielle Smith. Make sure to subscribe by searching Your Alberta or A.B. Danielle Smith on YouTube. Then just hit the subscribe button. And a reminder, our next program is on Budget Day. That is February 29th. We'll
We'll bring you a, a special look, a conversation with the Premier, with many of the ministers uh, to find out more details on the budget, where the uh, where the financial commitments are for Albertans, and I look forward into uh, to what's coming up uh, in the rest of the year. So we look forward to that. Again, that's coming up on the 29th of the month. And that does it for this episode of the Alberta Update. As always, thank you for sharing some time with us, and we'll see you again next time. 